Welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. In this podcast, we discuss mystical works of literature and how they relate to recovery. We hope you enjoy today's podcast episode. Hello, this is Buddy C. Welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. Today we have Amy and Marla and Dennis and Ted. Good to have you guys today. We'll be talking about the introductory chapters of Wentza and just going through and getting some background on the book. And then if we have time, we'll talk about the first verse, but I don't know if we'll really have time for that. You can check buddyc.org. There's a lot of resources there. Uh, We have a nightly 9 p.m. Eastern open online meeting of AA. You can get there at zoomaameetings.com. Lots of resources at buddyc.org. So check that out. There's Craig. Let's harass Craig. Better late than never, I guess. So why are you late? Well, he wasn't shaving. Oh. Leave him alone. He left. Oh, well. Now he's back. Okay. Why am I late? Right. Yeah. I'm trying to think up some excuse. Um, we don't need to. Are we recording yet? Yeah, we're recording. Oh, right. Okay. Right. Um, I was busy. He was okay. answering emails, um, Facebook yeah. posts, helping. That's that's, 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 that's that's exactly what I was doing, Amy. And if if Justine is listening, I, I've kind of got a confession to make. I declined your, your your request to join the Facebook page by mistake because I've got stubby fingers. And you can see my fingers. My fingers are bigger than the buttons that's on the phone. And I woke up and I didn't have my glasses on and I pressed decline instead of approve. I've sent you a, a, a message with the link so if you can send it on again, then I'll get you admitted straight away. Everybody switch those buttons too. <laughs> Just, you know, like the Zoom buttons to remove and admit. I've disabled, but I've disabled my decline button for now. Just until just until Justine gets back, and then normal service will resume. So Justine, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> All right, Craig, we're in Winsa. We're starting with the introduction. First page there uh, in Roman numeral seven. I'm just going to read the parts I have highlighted and then let me know if you guys have anything to add or any comment. This is a little bit of the historical background so that we can kind of understand why we're reading this book. Uh, the once also known uh, by the honorific title, Understanding the Mysteries, is one of the great source books of Taoism, written more than 2,000 years ago. Once it covers the whole range of classical Taoist thought and practice, long neglected by all but initiates. With this English translation, the work is now available in the Western language for the first time. This was in 1991. So before 1991, this was not translated into English. So not that long ago, uh, this was not available to us. Uh, The Winsa presents a view of Taoism that is quite different from that projected by Western scholars and more in accord with Taoist conceptions. Its compilations attributed to the disciple of Lao Tzu, reputed author of the classic Tao Te Ching, and most of its contents are attributed to Lao Tzu himself. Names may refer not only to supposed individual persons, but also to schools and traditions associated with those individuals or their circles. Uh, For example, um, a lot of books at that time and even up through biblical times, the person who wrote the book did not title it as being written by them. They would title it as being written by someone else who would give more credence to the book. So that happened all the time. Uh, a lot of the books of the Bible, like the Nag Hammadi books, they may say the book of uh, someone, and it may be that person's disciples, not that person who wrote the book. They believe that even for the Gospels in the New Testament may have been written by different people other than Luke, may have been written by someone other than them, but by their the disciples. But is it, you just said, so it would give more credit to the book? Right. Or so, is it humility as well? 
Well, it was just the standard practice at that time to give the book more credence so people would read it. Was mm-hmm. what was what I understand. But it's also a hum- humility thing too, Amy. When you realize that it's not about you, you know, it's about right. what you're writing. You know, right? Yeah. According to tradition, uh, Taoist tradition, the ancient sage Lao Tzu was not an isolated. Uh, isolated individual, but a member of an esoteric circle, he's believed to have had several disciples, to each of whom he passed on a collection of ancient Taoist teachings. The book known as the Wentza is one such collection elaborating on the teachings of the Tao Te Ching in a series of discourses attributed to the ancient master Lao Tzu. Anything else? Any comments on that first page, guys? Okay, next page near the bottom. From internal evidence, it's clear that the spiritual lineage of the Wentza is rooted in the Tao Te Ching, the Chantza, and the Huanansa. It follows up and elaborates upon the teachings of all of these ancient works. The Wentza is therefore one of the very few great Taoist classics of the entire Han Dynasty. And even though it predates the turn of the millennium, it is, it is already one of the last in the ancient philosophical lineage of Lao Tzu and the Tao Te Ching. So it's an important book to read. And it has a lot of good uh, uh, Taoist philosophy and should help us to apply the Tao Te Ching more to our life. Now, on page nine, in terms of its contents, the Wentza presents a distillation of the teachings of its great predecessors, especially the Tao Te Ching, uh, Chantsa and Huanatsa, it particularly follows the latter in its inclusion of selected material from Confucian, legalist, and naturalist schools of thought. In addition, the Wentza also contains a tremendous amount of other proverbial and aphoristic lore that is not to be found in its predecessors. In other words, uh, aphoristic, I had to look that up, is sayings that say a lot in a few words, like our paradoxes, that kind of a thing. So uh, what this is going to do and what I have read of it helps me to to maybe see a different view of of some of the Tao Te Ching. Like, you know, we might see one view of like like you're looking at a a sculpture from one view. Then you turn and look at it from another angle and you see something different. Well, that's what this book has been doing for me. It helps me see things a little different. Now, I hear things that I've heard in the Tao Te Ching, but they're just said a little differently. Just raise your hand virtually if you have something to add. I'm just going to keep going through what I have highlighted in these pages. Uh, Middle of page nine, once it touches upon the relationships among the ideas of the various schools. Then I want to talk about real people on page 10. Uh, This book talks about real people. And real people are those who have realized the Taoist ideal of freedom from artificiality. So when it says real people, it's talking about the people following the Tao. The concealment of the leadership of real people in unobtrusive spontaneity is a correspondingly common Taoist idea. The real people are believed to be hidden naturally not because they're secretive in the ordinary sense of the word, but because they do not aggrandize themselves or call attention to themselves, which we've seen that in what we read in the Tao Te Ching and in the Chantzu too. Then let's skip a few pages unless you guys have anything. And I'm going over to page 21. If you have anything in those pages in between, let me know that really stood out. Nothing in there really stood out to me He's reviewing different parts of the book there that we're going to read. Yes, Amy. I couldn't find my raise your hand function. Um, yeah, the middle of, um, what is that, 19? No, I mean, 14, shit. I don't know about Roman, Roman okay. numerals. The way of developed people is to cultivate the body by calmness and nurture life by frugality. To govern the body and nurture essence sleep and rest moderately, eat and drink appropriately, harmonize emotions, simplify activities. Those who are inwardly attentive to the self attainness and are immune to perverse energies. Thank you. It's interesting. How do we do those things? 
by being inwardly attentive. Hmm. God conscious. Do what? God conscious. Yeah. Not like Jesus Bible God that y'all know that. Hey, let me let me. I had a little God moment this morning. I had a little epiphany. I want to run this by y'all. I always do the same thing, Amy. I always. If I use the word God, I want to clarify, hey, now this is what I mean. I don't mean this, but I do mean, you know, that kind of a thing. Craig shaking his head. I realized something this morning that the way that we describe God is very akin to the way that we handle thoughts in meditation. We have to look past the words that are being used and look beyond them as to what the meaning is behind the words, just like letting those thoughts go as we meditate to look behind those things. And I thought, wow, that's right, because no matter if I use God or Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, or, you know, something Buddha or what, yeah, I know, Amy, that turns me, that gets me too. Uh, Whatever it is, how I describe my higher power or God consciousness or whatever the words are we put to that, we've got to look past those words as to what's behind that. Does that resonate or does that make sense? Greg? I think it makes perfect sense. Okay. And the reason I was shaking my head when you were saying every time I say God and, you know, I feel like I have to justify, I really don't think we should have to justify the words that we use um, and and we see it in the and anybody that gets the, the daily dow from buddy he's always got a little part of the bomb that says it's uh, something to do with god and there's an asterisk next to it and every time i fall for it every single time i keep forgetting what the asterisk is for and i read down i hit the button that says you know this is my interpretation of god please use your own i'm like do you know what? why are we justifying our own our own um it's not, so much justify, it's not so much justifying, but why are, we, why are we having to sit and explain our own definition of something when, you know, we, we can just use that word God, you know, or higher power? You know, I, I, I think we spend far too much time defending our own beliefs and our, you can laugh as much as you want, Amy. I've, I've just had a spiritual epiphany. Or is this, is this maybe, man, maybe stealing your thunder? You know, I really don't need to just... It's, She's not here, so I can say it. It's just like when I come home and, I, you know, my wife expects me to justify myself. To, I don't have to justify anything. <laughs> and it's the same with this concept of the higher power or the, um, the God concept that we have. I think sometimes I'm trying to explain it to people because I'm, is it maybe because I'm embarrassed about my, 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 um, my beliefs or my, my, my understanding of, of my God? Um, or higher power, or insert as you see appropriate. Thank you, Craig. Amy? Yeah, when I giggle and nod, it's because I can totally relate and understand and identify and agree. So I think, um, so we don't spend so much time justifying, right? <laughs> that's, like, that's what we're talking about. But I think for me, I because the Jesus Bible God was so shoved down my throat growing up. And, and I think it just might be a Southern Baptist thing, a Southern Bible belt thing. It was so shoved down my throat that I want, I just want to make sure people know that that's not the God that I'm talking about. It's not that I feel like I definitely, I, I it's not that I feel like I need to justify or rationalize or explain my beliefs. I just want to make sure, you know, it's not that. That's me, Amy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we've 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 just discussed not having to justify anything. We've just justified by not having to justify anything that we don't want to justify. Exactly. Yeah. I'm actually listening to a book uh, called "When Everything's on Fire," uh, and it's by um, Brian Zand, and he's talking about um, about the, the difference in just what Amy was talking about, the, the type of religion that was, or, or the, the God aspect that was kind of drummed into us or, you know, thrown at us just to, just to try and maybe give us that fear of God, um, just to try and keep us in line. Um, it's, it's actually a good book of explaining things from different perspectives. And that's kind of what I've picked up from that as well. I really don't need to justify 
um, just find things. But what I do a lot of times is I turn people off when they start with some one that I don't agree, you know, that, that doesn't resonate with me when I need to listen to what they're saying behind that. Yeah, that's, that's, just, that's, that's, that's an issue with them, not you. That's just, just let it go, No, no, no. What I'm saying is when someone's sharing, Craig, and I, and I have a tendency if they start with some of that to just, you know, well, think about maybe. something else, you know, and uh, there, there may be some gifts there that I'm missing. Dennis? Yes, well, it's actually funny because that was on the topic this morning. Um, and, and, and I like the thing that you go in between the words, right? So we, we learn in our program the language of the heart, right? But we also have to listen with the heart. And, and I, if I pay too much attention to the lyrics of what it says here, then, then I'm, I'm lost, sometimes even with keeping up with, with what's being read. And funny thing is, I, you, you know, buddy, I've always had a, had a problem with 24 hours a day because it's, it was too Christian for me. But this morning, it actually touches it uh, very good in the meditation of the day. And then I don't want to butcher it, but it says that when, when you have a, a God concept that's beyond space of time, uh, space and time, then you can't really, uh, <laughs> then, then it's hard to put words on it. And we keep trying to explain it. So I'm happy that Greg, he said, why do we keep doing that? We all know what it is. And it doesn't matter how what angle we get into it, right? So, so that's actually very interesting that we always want to try. No, no, it's not that. It's, it's this. So, uh, really, <laughs> makes it more complicated than it really is. Yeah, that's uh, actually that's when I realized that was when I was reading the twenty four hours this morning, Dennis. Mm. So that spoke to me too, Marla. Well, it's just funny that we're talking about this Jesus thing. Because I just started going to an 11th step prayer meeting on for Thursday mornings at 8 a.m., which I miss very much with you, Craig. And I would never have done this before. I, these, you know, the 11th step prayer, the 7th step prayer, not part of my psyche. I didn't like them. I did an eye roll. And so this meeting, you spend 11 minutes meditating and writing. And people, they, you know, they read what they wrote, you know, dear Jesus, thank you so much for the day. And I pray to you, Jesus, for everything. And I'm trying, I'm, this whole meeting thing has been so uh, mind opening for me, you know, and that these prayers, really, I I don't have to put the God in there, but the prayers really are really how I want to live. Um, so it's been really eye opening about that. I I don't do the Jesus thing only probably because I'm Jewish. Jesus was a really good, cool dude, but he was a you know progressive liberal. And uh, well, you're a progressive liberal, and he was Jewish. Totally. So I know. So we we could we were probably we would have probably been really good friends, or maybe I would have been one of his hewers. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it was cute. I couldn't resist, Marta. Thank you. <laughs> Ted. Um, I just have to say that acceptance is the source of all my problems today. Uh, as soon as I start judging is when I start having problems. I know uh, a gentleman who refers to his higher power as the dude. Doesn't make any difference to me. I, I think of the big Lebowski when I hear the dude. But that's just me. And as soon as I start judging is when I start having problems. Um, someone else's God who works for them, it works, it works for me. I'm willing to try anything. Um, I, I honestly believe that acceptance is the source, that acceptance is the source of all my problems today. Thank you, Ted. Craig. Marla, I'm glad you found some sort of meeting the, the, the and I'm glad you found I'm glad you found something useful to replace. Well, not that my meeting wasn't useful because my, my meeting was fantastic, but I'm just you know, I'm just glad that you found because we always think that when something ends that you know it's ending for a bad reason, but something good has actually came out of it. So I'm, I'm glad you've I'm glad you're benefiting from it. All right, what is next on in the book? Anything else in those pages between page 15, 16? 17. 
If not, I want to start reading on the top of page 19, and I want to read the last two and a portion pages, the whole thing, and then we talk about a little bit of this today. We good? Okay. The Wentza proposes the possibility of freedom and dignity from the, for the individual and for humanity as a whole. For freedom and dignity are not without a price, not without responsibilities to the foundations of their very existence. In order to see what the basis of freedom and dignity are, the Wentza guides a thinker through the elemental patterns and reasons underlying the natural order and its reflection in human needs and human behavior. The way of Taoism is called simple and easy because it is not as complicated as a culture of manners and appearances, and it is not as hard as a culture of conflict and contentiousness. In its sophistication and comprehensive scope, combined with, it, with, an, accessible, combined with an accessible format and easy style, the Wensa is a crowning work of early Taoism. Like the other classics, its way does not admit of definition by a few cliches, but it does offer many useful summaries of what a Taoist considers a sensible way of life. In other words, it gives us a lot of experience. One of the simplest sets of statements in the Wentza on the three kinds of unnatural death demonstrates the interpretation of the individual, professional, social, and political dimensions of Taoist practice. The Wentz's description of these three kinds of unnatural death contains within itself the way to avoid them and live life to the full. There are three kinds of death that are not natural passing away. One, if you drink and eat moderately and treat the body carelessly and cheaply, then illness will kill you. Two, if you're endlessly greedy and ambitious then penalties will kill you. Three, if you allow small groups to infringe upon the rights of large masses and allow the weak to be oppressed by the strong, then weapons will kill you. Craig? That's kind of like the, um, the way that alcohol kills you. It has the, the, the spiritual, the mental, and then the physical um, killing of ourselves. And then, of course, when we when, when we start to go into recovery, it kind of reverses with physical, mental, and spiritual is the order that we, we tend to recover back in. You're right. Oh, go ahead, Marla. No, I was, was going to say you're right. It's you know the the delve into addiction. It's mental, emotional, and then physical. And yeah, coming out first, you got to take care of your body. Then your head follows. At least that was my experience. Well, I came in thinking that alcohol was my problem, that I had a physical and manageable, a manageability, that it was something physical that was my problem. Then I had to realize, no, it was just a symptom of the real problem, which was within. So, yeah. And that kind of goes, too, with that number three about allowing small groups to, to infringe upon the rights of large masses. I allowed one thing to control my life, you know? Anything else on that before we move on? Okay, this is the one, uh, this is the next section. It's about uh, the Wentza also speaks of four practices through which the way of government's comprehended, meaning the way of individual self-government as well as the way of government of nations. So this is talking about not only corporate government, but personal government too. Um, and I'm going to skip that next little paragraph, then go down to, the first one, when uh, the first of the four is when you're not confused by calamity or fortune, then you accord with reason and action and repose. Number two, when you're not joyful or angry at random, then you do not flatter people in hopes of reward or in fear of punishment. Number three, when you do not crave what is useless. You do not hurt your nature by greed. Four, when your desires are not immoderate, in other words, when you have moderate desires, then, you're, then you nurture life and no contentment. These four are not sought 
from without and do not depend on another. They are attained by turning back to oneself. Hmm. Attained by turning back to oneself. So the first one is not confused by circumstances. That goes back to the acceptance of what is, Ted, I think. Like you were talking about. Uh, I believe that too. I believe the acceptance of what is has to be the basis. Because if it's not, then it's not possible for us to gain any ground or, or hear anything of what's going on. But as long as you can discern reality. So I, I continuously find myself not trusting what I'm saying to myself, that I, I bust my own, bust myself. I don't, I don't know. It's, you got to know. I think more of that, that starts with, for me, being willing to accept things that I find unacceptable in the moment, like not always wanting things to be different. And then once I accept, then I know what can be changed and what can't. I don't know what can be like the serenity prayer says. I don't know what the difference between what I can change and what I can until I actually get some grasp of what really is. You know, buddy, I I have to agree with everything that you're saying. Um, I've often heard that what other people think of me is none of my business. Now, I've expanded on that a little bit in that what I think of myself is none of my business. So and I guess what I'm trying to say is a lot of times I don't even believe what it is that I'm saying or thinking. I have to work things out. Thank you, Ted. Dennis? Yes. Uh, it's kind of funny. Even that I'm stone cold sober, I just think, don't think reality is the most fun place to be in, right? I always want to be somewhere else where it's more pleasant. But the sad thing is, is it's, it's the only place where I can get a decent meal. <laughs> um, and, and I was thinking when it says to return to yourself uh, or re- return, return home, home to yourself, that, that is that is that gap in between the meditation I'm thinking we're just being, right? And, 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 but, uh, but catching myself in, 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 in wanted not to be where, where I'm at. I just, I saw the, the documentary of Anthony Bourdain today. Always, and it was kind of funny, ties into the reading this morning. There was on, on, on suicide on, on the 24 hours a day, right? And uh, and one thing I could relate to is that I always want to go when I, I I'm always in a hurry. I'm in a hurry to get into a project. I'm hurry to get out of a project. I'm hurry to get back home. I'm uh, hurrying up to get to work. So uh, and, and and that's that's uh, that's the practice, I guess. Not to, well, not to do. <laughs> learning then is learning that. What I'm looking for is in this moment. I used to think it was all the other things I was looking for, but the thing that all the spiritual practice does for me is brings me to where my feet are, brings me right to this moment. And the only contentment I've ever had has been when I've accepted the moment for what it is. I've never been content in things. I've never, you know, I thought that when, you know, like if I had, this much money in the bank, I'd be content. And if I had that much in the bank, I'm like, no, I'm not content. Why, this isn't working. You know, and then I realized it wasn't in those things. Hmm. So don't get me wrong. I'd rather have the zeros than not, but, but, the, but it's not there. You know, that's not the place. Hmm. That's why it's about being content with what you have. I asked my Christian friend this week, there's a, there's a verse that says, be content with what you have, for this is the will of God concerning you. I said, how many times have you heard that preached on? They said, never. I said, yeah. I said, because we're never content with what we have. Yeah. Uh, that's the first one. The second one is when you are not joyful or angry at random. Then you so what, does that mean? Do what? what does that mean? I thought this meant trying to manipulate folks to find happiness that when you're not joyful or angry at random when you do not flatter people in hopes of reward or in fear of punishment so you're expecting them to make you happy 
or if you if it's a fear involved, that's what I was thinking. It may mean something different. What do y'all think? Marla said she does. Doesn't know. Okay. No, I think she said I don't. Like I don't think. <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Okay. Number three, when you do not crave what is useless, you do not hurt your nature by greed. How many times have I thought that if I got something, it would make me happy? And then once I got it, I felt no different whatsoever. That's crazy. For me, that would be crazy. I think that's craving what's useless. You know, it's it's like things that don't serve you anymore. That's yeah. how I'm looking at like I sometimes I, I have to think when I'm looking at something, do is this gonna serve me? Is this gonna enhance my life in any way? Usually the answer is no. I mean, how many That's goals maybe. have you set? And once you reach that goal, then you're like, I really this really isn't what I thought it was going to be. Hmm. Any other comments on that one? Okay. And then number four, when your desires are not immoderate, then you nurture life and no contentment. So when you do not have excessive desires, in other words, you can find contentment. And the solution to these is to turn the light around. Got to look within, just like in that one that you were talking about, Amy, inward attentiveness. Same thing. Got to look within. And they do not depend on another. So it's saying that, you know, one won't create the other. They're all found by looking within. Then the last section here. Finally, there's a grand vision of Halicean, an ideal society guided by wisdom. That's what that word means, an ideal society guided by wisdom, in which all people and all things equally find their places in an organic whole where they can express their individualities and exercise their particular abilities to the greater good of one and all. What the sky covers, what the earth supports, what the sun and moon illuminate is variegated in form and nature, but everything has its place. What makes enjoyment enjoyable can also create sadness, and what makes security secure can also create danger. Therefore, when sages govern people, they see to it that people suit their individual natures. We secure, be secure in their homes live where they're comfortable, work at what they can do, manage what they can handle, and give their best. In this way, all people are equal with no way to overshadow each other. Now, that sounds like some utopia that I don't think we'll ever see, you know, governmentally, but applying that to your life, apply that to your life's a different story. It's interesting there that it says to overshadow each other. I've gotten more feedback on the story we did a couple of weeks ago. The uh, when the guy's trying to outrun his shadow, I've gotten more feedback. People saying that's their favorite story out of the book. Uh, I've and I've been thinking about that story more and more as a real uh, example of powerlessness. When the guy just uh, he he dis- he was disgusted with his shadow and didn't like his footsteps, so he decided he had outrun them. When he couldn't do that, instead of trying something different, he just tried twice as hard. Because really, it's probably the only tool he had. The only thing he knew he could do was to run, to outrun it. Then he died because he ran too much. When all he had to do was step into the shade, and there, all he had to do to quit making footsteps was to be still. And that's a, for me, that's a good example of letting go, stepping into the shade and just stopping the self-effort. And sometimes that's a lot harder work than trying to outrun it. it, is for me. Comments? You know, and that carries that idea that, that we see all through all this Taoist philosophy that everything has its place. Where, you know, every step is on the path. All the seasons follow each other. You know, it's summertime here now. I'm not afraid it's going to be winter next or spring again, it's going to be fall. Then it's going to be winter. Then it'll be spring again. Then it'll be summer again. You know, all of that just stays in order. And if we know that that's the orders, why do we not think our lives are in order as well? 
Do y'all really think everything has its place in your life? Just talk like your life. Can you look back in your life and see anything? I can't see anything in my life. I used to think I was bouncing around, but when I look backwards, I see a straight line from one to the next, to the next, to the next. Um, and I asked my Christian friends about this one day, posed the same question, and they could not come up with anything in their life either. And they do not think that things are by providence. They think that they, um, their life's based on what they believe and how they trust God and that kind of thing. So the way I think every step's on the path, they don't think that. Uh, and I was curious to have, if they punch holes in that idea, and they, they couldn't punch holes in that. Can you repeat that question again, buddy? Yeah. Do you see things in your life that, looking back, that were not on the path for you, that you that did not serve you no, in some no. way? Like mistakes, like things that you say, you know, that should have not happened. That was not for my, my I can't speak to. Uh, I, I know there's people that's had abuse and different things. I can't speak to that, but I can only speak to my life. And for me, I can't see things that were in my life at this point that were really say, you know, this was a mistake in my life. I can't see that. First marriage. Well, I can't even say that or even the second marriage. Cause I got like my kids, you know, yeah. like, yeah. I learned from both my marriages. I wouldn't like, be the person I am today. Right. And and that's what it, that's it exactly for me. I I know that I am who I am today because of every single thing that ever happened. Was it ideal? Was it the most pleasant? Was it always unicorns and rainbows? Absolutely freaking not. Um, but did the universe use those circumstances to teach me and mold me and to help me become more of my true authentic self. It may have taken a day or a week, a month or a year or hell, how long was I out there? Like 22, 23 years. It may have taken that long. Right. But even my experience drinking and drugging out there is now beneficial. Night step promises, right? No matter how far down the scale we've gone, we'll see how our experience can benefit others. So maybe at the time it felt like a mistake. Um, but your question, looking back, mm -mm. no, so, it was all for a reason. And Amy, you said how our experience can benefit others, not benefit us. Right. That's good. But, I hadn't thought about that before. Yeah, but it goes back because helping others helps me mm -hmm. so that's yeah. that idea of the collective body the collective consciousness that this is alluding to uh ted yeah um i happen to agree with amy here uh very simply what i've learned um frankly in in the aa meetings is nothing happens in god's world by mistake um, and I honest, I honestly believe that uh, nothing happens in, you can just say, the world by mistake. Um, I know there's a lot of things in my life that someone else might have considered to be a mistake, but I certainly don't. It's led me to where I am right now. That's cool. Sometimes it's cool. Sometimes it's not. <laughs> but Thanks, Ted. Ted, we're agreeing today. I share a lottery ticket. Maybe we need to buy one today. Well, That's good. You buy one if you win, I'll pay you back. Yeah. We can split it, right? <laughs> I'm I'm intrigued though, buddy. You said your your Christian friends. I love how you say that, by the way. My Christian friends. <laughs> um they believe that everything in their life happens because of their beliefs. But don't Christians believe that everything like God already knew every single step of the path. I'm confused. Mm -hmm. Well, they believe that uh, their form of Christianity, that life is full of choices and that there's uh, your life is. Um, you have your will and the will of God. And if God has a will for you, that's different from yours. 
and that you can go your own way and do your own thing. And those things would not, you know, that, that would be a different path than what, so they don't believe everything is as it should be. I, you know, I don't, I don't know if I necessarily accept that acceptance, <laughs> you know, um, but, um, oh gosh, what was I going to say? It's like, <sighs> senior moment, sorry. I think everything's as it should be because it is. You know, if I could make a different decision, I would. If I had the same situation again, I would make the same decision again. It's really not a decision. I really don't make any decisions because it's not like this time I would have gone right instead of left. I would have done the exact same, made the same decision based on the same thinking that I had at that very moment. So Exactly. So it's, it's, it's like if you knew then what you knew now, wouldn't make any difference. Right. It wouldn't make any difference at all. I'd still do the same stuff. Um, I, I was thinking that maybe um, if there's God's way and my way, I can always, you know, defer God's way. I don't necessarily believe that either. I, I believe that everything is the right way. Uh, you know, I like I say, if somebody take a, would take a look at my life, they would say, oh, man, you really screwed up here and there. I really don't think so. I don't think so. I made the best decision I could at that moment, Ted. Yep. And if I had it to do again, I probably would have done the same thing again. I don't think I would have made different decisions, at least not the major ones, you know. And there, there's a Bible verse that talks about that. It says that God works every detail of our lives of love into something good. That's Romans 8 in the message version, I think. But I think that's maybe it. This world is ever expanding and we're part of that expansion and it's happening all the time. And uh, there, there's no other world to compare it to. There's no other decisions to compare it to. So it really can't be good or bad. It's just the decision we made. It's like saying the universe is expanding in, a, in the wrong way. It shouldn't have done this and it should have done that. No, it's just happening as it's happening. There is no judgment on it being right or wrong. We do that. We bring that judgment in because of our fear. I'm just thinking about your Christian friends. Oh, see, guys, we need to maybe we can invite them one day. <laughs> I think we should. I've got loads of questions. So, uh, uh, maybe they're the, the kind that just think I'll go and do what I want, and then I'll get judged at the end of it. You know, I'll, I'll sit in there. Well, I'm very sit devout there. guys. Don't get me wrong. I don't. I'm not criticizing them. I just my ex-wife used to call them my Christian friends, and it was kind of funny. <laughs> well, you know, well, we, we are. Yeah. <laughs> But they're not our friends, so we can criticize them. So I have, have nothing to lose. It just, just kind of reminds me that the story of Jonah, where he, where God tells him to go to Nineveh, and he's like, nah, I might not. And then he goes on a journey, and then he ends up in a boat, and then things start to go wrong. So the sailors chuck him over the over the water, and then a big whale comes and swallows him, and he ends up in Nineveh because God told him that's where he was going. So I think it's just exactly as what you were talking about. You know, everything's, everything's happened because that's, that's what's supposed to happen. I don't think it, I don't think any decisions that I've made would have changed drastically to where I am in the situations that I'm in in life at the moment. Uh, I think if anything, I, I'm going to agree with Amy for once that you know things have actually have actually worked out the way they're, they're supposed to do, and you know I think it's, it's built the character and it's built the um, it's built the strength that I need to to be doing what I'm doing. I mean, even down to some of the simplest things. The other day, I've never done this, and I meet with, I don't know, eight, six or eight sponsees a week at the same time on the hour once a week, and they're all on my schedule, and I work around them. And there was one that came up at time, and I forgot about it. I was busy doing other things, and I just for, and I've never done that before. I've never forgot about someone. And I looked, and it was 10 o'clock, and we're supposed to meet at 930, and I text him. And he never forgets that he's always there. He forgot too. Both of us the same day. And we've been meeting for years and we've neither one of us have ever forgotten. I'm like, what is that about? I mean, I'm, things I like that, the, you know. I remember the meeting you fell asleep in. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was because we were re reading the history of Chinese philosophy. <laughs> it's one of those awkward moments. Good like material. It was really an awkward moment. I was like, I was reading. I was like, "Buddy, fell asleep. <laughs> what, what do I do? What's the? Do I just end the call and <laughs> leave him be?" 
<laughs> it's, it's not as if I can go and tuck him in and put a little blanket over him. And... Yeah, it was that was a tough one. I'm glad we stopped that one. The Cloud of Unknowing was another good sleep, was more some good sleeping material. Yes, sir, it, it was. A... <laughs> Anything else on this, guys? I think we started talking about Providence, really, is where we ended up. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, talking about conceptions of God. Byron Katie, her perception of God is reality. What is would be her perception of God. So when we say acceptance of what is, there it is. Anything to add, guys? Pretty good conversation today. We got a little more out of that than I thought we would. I know a little, little of that was dry, but next week we'll do the first, the first verse of this. And then that'll give us a good one to go ahead and get a good start on this book. Anything else before we close? Thank you for hosting, buddy. As I really enjoy it, guys. This is this is really a meant a lot to me in my recovery. So thank you. Did thank help. You. Mine too. If there's nothing else. I'll see you guys next week. Hello, this is Buddy C. I wanted to make you aware of several recovery-related resources that I've posted in the episode description. These resources include a list of recovery podcasts, a free sober meditation app daily recovery email, shared Google recovery calendars. Hope you put some of these resources to use and have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends in recovery.